General David Petraeus is a retired U.S. Army general. He spent 37 years in the uniform. He went to combat tours to Iraq and Afghanistan. Also, uh, General Petraeus was uh, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Welcome to our program, General Petraeus. Good to be back with you, Daniel. I would like to start with the major news with long-range strikes on Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that the U.S. authorization to strike deep inside Russia could change the course of the war and could force Russia to negotiate, could force Russia to seek peace. Uh, what is your take on that? And do you feel that this decision could change the course of this war? Well, first of all, I think President Zelensky is exactly right that the restrictions on that currently exist on the use of our Army tactical missile system and also the UK's Storm Shadow, a similar long-range uh, missile, should be lifted. Uh, it's incomprehensible to me why it has taken this long to do that, especially after what Russia has done to Ukraine. Remember hitting the Children's Hospital uh, in Kiev, another hospital just 48 or 72 hours ago. Uh, the barbaric use of these glide bombs, 6,000 pound munitions that are not in the least, least bit precise, just hammering into cities, especially uh, Kharkiv. Uh, systematically going after the electrical generation uh, of Ukraine, the transmission, every hydroelectric plant, and all the rest of this. Again, unconscionable. Uh, and the fact that we would restrict the use of our systems against Russian soil, uh, even as Ukrainians are already going after uh, Russian targets on Russian soil every single night, and have actually conducted a surprise offensive, a very impressive uh, that still controls somewhere around a thousand square kilometers uh, of Russian territory. So I hope that this, uh, the latest word from the White House is that this is a subject of intense negotiations. Um, I'm hoping that that will result in announcement or, or just authorizing the full use without announcing would be fine as well, although I'm sure there will be a, a compulsion to, to make that announcement. Maybe when President Zelensky is in the United States, that may, may be one of the deliverables at that time. And the idea that some have put forward in Washington that, well, the Russians have moved all the targets that would be added, uh, would be vulnerable. There's still many, many dozens, probably over 100 significant targets that you just can't pick up and move because now all of a sudden they're within the range of the Army Tactical Missile System or Storm Shadow. So I think this should be done, uh, should be done as soon as is absolutely possible. Uh, to be candid, this is a little bit similar to some of the other decisions that have stretched out, in my view, too long. F-16s, uh, the U.S. Army's M1 tanks, which delayed the Leopards, uh, the Army tactical missile system in the first place, convention cluster munitions, and so on. Noting, though, that the U.S. obviously has been the leader uh, its response initially and throughout the course of this war uh, has been extraordinary, albeit with the delay of this latest uh, assistance. But $61 billion is the latest package from the U.S. That's larger than the defense budgets, I think, of any European country. Uh, so, so, so there should be a recognition of how substantial the U.S. support has been, even as individuals like me ask why certain decisions have taken too long. Wall Street Journal really reported that 90% of Russia's aircraft has been redeployed from out of the range of attack on systems. Don't you think that the U.S. hesitation to allow Ukraine to strike Russia has allowed Russia to redeploy its most valuable assets out of the range of attack on systems? Uh, I, I think that is probably correct. Uh, again, uh, there's probably some use of these airfields temporarily or as refueling or temporary basing and so forth. And uh, if they haven't already moved them, they will. Uh, but that, that doesn't matter. There are dozens. The Institute for the Study of War, the best think tank in America on uh, the war in Ukraine, has mapped out many, many dozens of fixed installations that should be targeted and could be if the restrictions were lifted. And again, I'm hopeful that this will be the case. I, I would be careful, though, not to create expectations that may not be met. I, I don't know that this, in truth, changes the entire course of the war. I think it, I think it changes the dynamics uh, of the present time. We should also recognize there are limits to the number of ATACMs that we, we can provide to Ukraine. There, these aren't 
There's not a vast number of these in inventory. Again, it's a huge warhead, very capable. We fired 103 of these during the fight to Baghdad when I was a two-star general uh, commanding the great 101st Airborne Division during the fight to Baghdad. They're devastating in their effectiveness, but they're not unlimited in their number. And, I, and in fact, if I could, I think actually more important than that is what has been ongoing, which is the Ukrainian development of unmanned systems uh, on a scale that has never been seen before. And we don't do. Uh, and just building new units constantly. Uh, there are now reportedly drone platoons in every infantry battalion. As they go up, then there are ones for maritime, there are ones for long range, there are ones for short range, mid range. I visited with a, a, a unit today and saw what they'd done in the first, they've only been together for six months. And these are very cheap drones compared with how much it costs to get them in the United States. And they're constantly uh, adapting, refining, iterating as the Russian electronic warfare, jamming other systems, air defense and so forth, continue to evolve and adapt as well. And what is being done here has never been done anywhere else in the world and is not being done uh, anywhere else in the world. And we need to learn from this and see how it is uh, that a country that doesn't have remotely the economic might that we have uh, is doing what we cannot right now do. Also, The Guardian reported that Ukrainian military leaders would like to strike Russia's military installations near the Moscow and St. Petersburg. They think that this strategy could bring the war closer to its end. What is your take on that? And don't you think that Moscow, St. Petersburg and other major cities could be a key terrain of so this war from a psychological standpoint? Well, in fact, there have been strikes against targets in Moscow. And I, what distinguishes Ukraine from Russia, of course, is that Ukraine is going after legitimate military targets according to the laws of land warfare and the Geneva Convention. Russia is indiscriminately targeting uh, civilian infrastructure, again, the hospitals even, and and often the first responders and so on, uh, all of which clear violations of the Geneva Convention, which is what they've done ever since the beginning. I mean, anybody who's in Kyiv obviously should go to Bucha and hear what took place there, uh, which to me suggested that the, the Russians have a culture of committing war crimes, not a culture of trying to observe the Geneva Convention. Uh, look, I was privileged to command two wars and had five combat commands as a general officer. There were mistakes made, civilians were killed, we had Abu Ghraib, we had other terrible mistakes, but we tried very hard to adhere to the Geneva Convention and the laws of land warfare. Russia seems to me tries to not pay attention to them uh, and so, sure, uh, everything that is a military, legitimate military target should be targeted. The challenge, of course, is that there's always trade-offs. What does it cost to create a, a missile or a drone or what have you that can hold those targets at risk, attack them? S somehow, Ukraine attacked the uh, Murmansk all the way uh, in the northern, northeastern or northwestern part of uh, Russia, very important port. Uh, so the capacity and capability of Ukraine continues to evolve and, and to improve and, again, get longer range, more precise, larger munitions and so forth. There's a limiting factor here, though, too, uh, and that is that just that this takes money. Uh, and I sat with the minister, former minister of uh, strategic industries the other night with all of the other ministers and people that are leading various efforts. Uh, you'll have heard there was a public announcement that Ukraine wanted to manufacture a million drones in a 12-month period. That's already now, it's several times that. I don't want to get more precise than that. But, and it could be even more. The capacity is much greater. The limiting factor is not capacity. It's actually the money uh, to uh, enable the uh, use of that capacity. So these are all ongoing. They're very, very impressive. We should be doing everything we can to enable them, but noting that there are always going to be trade-offs. You cannot do everything everywhere all at once. You have to figure out where you're going to focus, and, and that, I think, is ongoing as well because we had good conversations with other uh, leaders who are the ones that are guiding the overall strategy and the overall approach to this war. And again, having been privileged to command two wars at the very top, um, 
I think I know a little bit about what it looks like to do it reasonably well, uh, and the Ukrainian leaders are doing magnificently. But what is your take on the, such deep strikes inside Russia, even near the Moscow and St. Petersburg, but with the U.S. Western-made weapons? Well, I don't think you have uh, weapons that can range that, so I, don't, I just don't think it's a relevant question, frankly. Th this would have to be Ukrainian systems. But should Ukraine have uh, such weapons from your perspective? This, now we're into something that's very, very different. And it's not just the range. It's, you know, how do you launch these systems what it, it, and all the rest of this. And I, I don't think that you're going to see decisions made to, to provide those. Keep in mind that they're also incredibly costly. We can afford that. Our systems are very, very, very expensive. And actually comparable systems, if you compare the Switchblade 300 or the 600, which is actually an anti-armor suicide drone made by the US, it is many, many, many times more expensive than what Ukrainian companies are building here uh, in Ukraine and changing and evolving and refining all the time. We saw different, uh, I've seen these different systems. I've seen the version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and they say they're already working on 4.0 and constantly evolving so that you have the guidance systems that you, you deal with the realities of electronic warfare. Do you have a link to the, all of this? Um, and again, the cost here is so vastly less than it is for something that actually isn't even comparable in capability. But if you start to get into the world of the really long range munitions, you're talking about shooting huge sums of money downrange. And I just don't think in 61 billion is a lot of money, but then you slice it into the categories and you figure what category would fund that kind of presidential drawdown authority and transfer. And you're going to, that money is going to go pretty quickly. There's just one reason why it's great. For example, that, other NATO countries are providing the F-16s instead, in, instead of the U.S. having to do that because the cost of those is so substantial. Let's cover also Kursk cooperation. Uh, the longer Ukraine occupies Kursk, the weaker Vladimir Putin becomes. Do you, do you support this uh, idea, this status? I do. I recognize, though, there has been a trade-off. Again, these are four of Ukraine's or more uh, best brigades. Um, with, again, logistics, artillery, air defense, engineers, drones, uh, all of the enablers, uh, took the Russians completely by surprise, which is amazing in an era of ubiquitous uh, surveillance, uh, penetrated the Russians, exposed them for what they are, which is very incapable when it comes to their territorial defense forces and other local security forces, uh, showed that the Russian response was almost incoherent. Uh, you know, why would you actually assign the minister for emergency situations in charge of what has to be a military response? And it took them far too long. They are now uh, going after uh, trying to push to squeeze the Ukrainian uh, area of control uh, to try to push the eventually perhaps push the Ukrainians out. They've had to increase their forces to do that very substantially. But of course, again, there is a trade off because these could have been used uh, on the front lines, which are under pressure, particularly, of course, around Pokrovsk. But I'm hopeful, touch wood, uh, that the it, it'll be the Ukrainian drones, again, thousands of them at the enemy every single day. We actually have to think about these suicide drones very differently. You know, our mindset is that these are weapon systems. Uh, they're aircraft. They're not. They should be thought of as ammunition, as, as a round of sophisticated artillery. Um, and they should be, and they are being employed as such. You know, it's often observed that, well, there's nobody doing real close air support here. In other words, fighter bombers right on top of the troops bombing the enemy right out there. What, number one, it's very complex, but number two, the air defense threat is so significant on both sides that you don't see that here at all, a feature of our, our previous wars. You do actually have it, it's drones. And they're integrated, they're supporting very, very closely uh, those who are actually on the front lines. Uh, and that's their longer range artillery, if you will. That's their close air support uh, and so on. So um, that's very significant, but we do need to recognize that, again, this it has diverted. I think it's worth it. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of Russian soldiers have been captured just 
yesterday, I think it was, the third prisoner swap took place after not many for quite a period of time. There are reportedly thousands of Russians that are still trapped in one pocket and they can't get away because the bridges over the river that are at their back have all been blown up very skillfully by uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, so maybe there's a prospect of even more prisoners. Uh, and then the key is if the Russians eventually put enough pressure, yes, you might have to do an, a, a controlled withdrawal, uh, but they will have diverted a very substantial number of Russian forces. They will have given Putin a black eye. He doesn't even want to talk about this. Uh, he never d addresses this whatsoever. Uh, it has exposed the weakness uh, of his forces for all the world to see. But a lot of the judgment of this operation will depend on the ability to, st to stabilize the lines in the southeastern part of the country. And for that, of course, what has to happen is continued U.S. support, and it is continuing very much. I was just with a three-star brilliant U.S. Army officer who worked for me twice in combat and once before that. Um, the continued EU and individual European country support, uh, maybe most importantly, continued uh, acceleration of the recruiting, training, equipping of Ukrainian uh, soldiers for replacement and also for new organizations. Uh, and all of that, it, that may be the most important factor that will determine the course of the next few months uh, of the war, especially relative to what Russia does in that regard during that time. Would Russian elites forgive Vladimir Putin for his failures in the Kursk region? Look, I think Vladimir Putin is in a very strong situation. Uh, anybody that challenges him um, doesn't survive, basically. I mean, he, he poisons them, he kills them, he blows up their plane. So if you're going to go after Putin, um, and the insurance companies know you're not going to get a life insurance uh, premium. Um, so he has just eliminated all those who might oppose him. Everybody who is in a senior position has allegiance to him because they got their position, in part at least because of their loyalty to him, sometimes also because they might have a degree of competence. Uh, but they're not about to, to take, take him on. Um, and the oligarchs as well. The reason they are billionaires is because Vladimir Putin has showered them with good fortune. Also, uh, Vladimir Putin has warned to the West against providing Ukraine with this authorization to uh, strike Russia with Western made weapons. He said that uh, this decision could uh, bring NATO at war with Russia. Uh, do you think so? And uh, no, I don't. Do you I... think? Do you see this as a Russian bluff? I th no, I think you should be worried about this. You should evaluate. You should assess it. Uh, I'm sure this is one of the topics discussed in these intense negotiations that are going on in Washington and London. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have heard his threats since the very beginning of the war, sometimes including uh, threats of use of tactical nuclear weapons. And they have prov proved empty again and again and again. They're hollow. Uh, and he establishes red lines. Ukraine has crossed every red line. Uh, and again, he's doing everything he can uh, to destroy Ukraine, to deny its right to exist, uh, and to uh, eliminate it as an independent country. Uh, he's not holding anything back. Uh, some a journalist the other day said, oh, what else might he do? I, he's doing everything he possibly can. By the way, that is a lot in many cases, and it's causing enormous hardship. Uh, not just on the front lines for soldiers, which is obvious, but also enormous hardship uh, for everyday Ukrainian citizens. Uh, obviously, the power outages, the again, what lies ahead in the winter is going to be hard. Uh, inflation, all of these different issues for ordinary citizens. I was just sitting with one who's living here in Kiev and a relative of a friend. Um, this is difficult. People are war weary. Uh, they're tired. They know everybody knows has had a family member or loved one or friend lost in this war. Uh, they've seen the endless destruction wrought by Russian forces and the barbarity of what they have done. So I, th I think you have to understand that why, again, people are war weary. That's legitimate. It's understandable. But that doesn't mean there's not still that iron determination uh, not to let Putin achieve what he's trying to do. Do you see this as a U.S. strategy, just to try to 
try to avoid to undermine his F war effort, but not to allow Ukraine to let Ukraine win this war? No, I wouldn't go that far. I think we have done as much as we can with the resources that have been provided. Again, $61 billion is a massive quantity. Yes, a lot of that is replacing in our stockpiles what we have provided to Ukraine, but it also means that we can give more to Ukraine. Um, and again, the, the, it's a staggering amount of assistance uh, for another country at a time when we have, we're supporting another ally and partners in the Middle East, and we're obviously focused very intently on what has to be the main effort which is deterrence of aggressive action in the South or East China Sea. Um, so this is very, very substantial. I don't buy the idea that we're just giving them enough not, not to keep them from losing. Uh, we're giving as, really, I, it's never as much as we can, but you have to evaluate also still, what is this doing to your own posture? And we've drawn down some really critical munitions and weapon systems very, very substantial. We've pulled them out of other uh, potential war zones. So again, I think we have done and provided unprecedented assistance. I'd like to see us do even more for sure. Um, and I hope that that will continue. There is at the end of the day, strong bipartisan support for Ukraine in both houses of Congress and in the White House. And I think that actually will continue regardless of who's elected and regardless of some of the campaign rhetoric that we have heard from one of the candidates. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that now could be the right time to negotiate with Russia to try to find a peace. Uh, do you feel that Ukraine now is in a strong position to negotiate with Russia from a position of strength? Well, I'm a soldier, not a diplomat or a politician. I mean, militarily. And I... And I was just, that's just so that you understand why I'm going to be a bit direct. Um, I'm not sure that I see that. I think it is great to see what has happened in Kursk, but it's still an ongoing operation. Um, it's great to see the extraordinary casualties inflicted on Russian forces in Donetsk and Luhansk and elsewhere uh, along the front. Um, but that front is not fully stabilized yet. Uh, I think you actually have to achieve a different dynamic. I think you have to get to the point where Russia realizes this is really hurting us, which is why you have to go to targets in the Russian Federation, not just on Ukrainian soil. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't assess this to be the position of strength from which I'd like to see Ukraine as a strong supporter of Ukraine, as someone who's been coming here actually since it was still part of the Soviet Union and watched it evolve so impressively uh, in recent decades in particular, someone who wants to see the terrible ambitions of Vladimir Putin completely frustrated um, and who has been sanctioned by Putin, I might add as well. So and having been beaten out by Putin for time man of the year in 2007. <laughs> And I also would like to cover um, recent statements from GDUN. Says he said that Trump's plan to end the war in Ukraine could consist of a, a frozen conflict, a demilitarized zone, and uh, could involve barring Ukraine from joining NATO. Uh, from your perspective, how do you see this? What is your take on such uh, plans? There are also such plans I think in this media. Is, this is campaign rhetoric. Um, I just don't, I don't understand what he is talking about, frankly. Um, and I, I don't think it's workable. Uh, I don't think either side is ready to negotiate right now. It takes not just one, but two. And again, I think Putin still is not convinced that he cannot achieve his objectives, at least in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, and until we have helped Ukraine show that he's not going to achieve his ambitions. And the longer the war goes on, the worse it's going to be for him and for his people. Uh, you won't have that kind of position from which you could actually negotiate something mean meaningful. And by the way, for those countries that are trying to push Ukraine into a negotiation with Russia, especially one that might, might officially give up some of sovereign Ukrainian territory, there should be an ironclad security guarantee part of that, which would include membership in NATO and there should be a fast track path to the EU membership as well. And my final question for you, the United States uh, has confirmed Iran 
that Iran had provided Russia yes. with ballistic missiles, uh, short range, but uh, uh, it could be even more range in the future. Uh, do you do you think that it's it could be a sign of the biggest big failure of the U.S. deterrence around the globe? And not necessarily, although I, I think we have issues with with deterrence of certain actions. Obviously, not not succeeding. Um, I think the biggest effort in deterrence with Iran is to ensure that they never uh, take the final step to enrich the weapons grade uranium and make a nuclear weapon. We have said that if you do that, we will destroy your nuclear program. And when I was the U.S. Central Command commander, it's publicly known that we developed a plan to do just that. Um, but no, I, again, there's all kinds of actions around the world that, again, we'd rather not see taking place, but I don't know that they have been the subject of huge efforts of deterrence. And in fact, U.S. Is, and others are going to Put more sanctions on Iran. I suspect after the election uh, that you'll see substantial additional sanctions imposed on Iran. Right now, during an election season, uh, we want to allow them to continue to export their 1.5 million barrels of crude oil and distillates, or else the price of gasoline at the pump will go up. You can't ever forget uh, the, the relevance, if you will, of domestic politics in a U.S. presidential election year. Thank you, sir, for your time, uh, for your uh, support for Ukraine, for advocating for more aid for Ukraine and uh, glory to Ukraine. It's a moral obligation to do that and, and glory to Ukraine indeed. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava.